Welcome to the Winning Edge Investments Podcast. Winning Edge Investments provides industry-leading horse racing and sports betting tips, ratings and education, enabling you to invest intelligently and treat your betting like a business. Go to www.winningedgeinvestments.com to learn more about how you can start to supercharge your betting bank immediately. Treat your betting like a business and invest intelligently with Winning Edge Investments. This week on the Winning Edge podcast, we're joined by professional punter and form analyst, Peter Lawrence. G'day, Peter. How are you? Very well, Brad. Thanks for having me on. No worries at all. Thanks for giving us some of your time to talk about your career and your views on the sport. Um, So tell us how you got into racing. My father, even though he was a dentist, his father was a racehorse trainer in uh, Rockhampton and his brother was also a jockey. So he he always had a you know, acute interest in racing. And even though I had uh, two brothers who showed no interest in racing at all and my mother wasn't interested, I obviously inherited his genes. And when I was a very small boy, maybe six or seven years old, I primarily at that time was interested in the trots, which um, some of the older listeners may well remember. The trots were much more popular many years ago. And in fact, on a Friday night on the ABC, they used to have the two legs of the Daily Double live. And then in between the sixth and the eighth race, they would uh, have replays of the other races that had been run that night. And the uh, dividend, the betting units in those days were 25 cents. And I used to have... 25 cents on a couple of trotters during the night, which would be frowned upon these days, <laughs> having your six or seven year old son <laughs> having a bet on the, on the trots. Um, my first, uh, my earliest memory of actually going to the races was actually going to see a dog at the, at the dogs in Bathurst called Zoom Top. That was a famous Australian dog at the time. And I remember having one dollar on it, and it was uh, four to one on, and it got beaten. So that's my actual earliest memory of going to a, a race <laughs> meeting of sorts. Uh, I didn't learn my lesson then about backing short price favourites, but um, and then I guess as as time went on, and as I got a little bit older, I became more interested in the races. And always was still quite interested in the in the trots, even up until, you know, maybe I was fifteen or sixteen years old, and would get the um, trot guide trot guide on a Wednesday, and still be very interested. And in fact, um, because we lived in Bathurst during those times, went to the Bathurst trots, which used to be on on a uh, Tuesday night. My father actually was friendly with the. Um, a couple of farmers there that owned uh, Hondo Grattan that was a, a champion uh, pacer. Yep. And he did actually own a third of Hondo Grattan for a short period of time. But we left Bathurst and went to live in England for a while. And they could they actually couldn't afford to race Hondo Grattan because the, the wool industry was, the wool prices were bad. Right? And so they gave his third share to Tony Turnbull, who was the trainer. Yep. So he became the owner. And then we came back to Australia to live maybe nine months later and Hondo Grattan had his first start one night at Bankstown. And after that, he became a, a great champion. So my early, I had a real interest in the trots early on, but as I got a bit older, that interest uh, waned and I became more, more and more interested in the races. All right, so tell us about your major influences early on. Well, in that period where I was a, a, a teenager interested in the races, I was always uh, looking at ways to, to actually win. I was always interested in reading about um, punters and get the racetrack every month. I used to think it, I think it came out in those days. And my early... Um, journey into trying something new was that 
Um, Racetrack published what I guess people would think of now as par times for all the different metropolitan race courses in Sydney and Melbourne yep. with a like a, um, a point system on this many points for this time. And it was a very basic thing, didn't take into account track conditions or anything like that. And so I was very interested in um, comparing times of different horses and trying to um, back, back winners like that. And then when I was about uh, 15 or 16 years old, the Don Scott book Winning came out. And I suppose that really had a, a dramatic influence on my life. Uh, reading about someone who'd won at the races, how they did things in a systematic way to, you know, quantify some sort of qualitative judgment on the races. And so I, Scott definitely had a, a huge influence on the way I did the form, the way I approached betting on races, the idea that you would set your own market and try and back overlays, all the things that are commonplace now. Having that experience, reading that book on Scott and reading other books, um, uh, Pittsburgh Phil's book and a few other books, and then I always had a great, a real interest in, in the times. And I tried to combine the Scott method with the uh, times, a times method that I had gleaned from, from that racetrack era. And I, and that's really how I started off trying to do something a little bit different. And so that studying of the form and learning more about it, that led to a career in bookmaking? Yeah, it did. Um, down the track, a, a few years on from that, I uh, convinced my father to um, float me some reasonably small bank <laughs> and uh, went bookmaking. And um, even though this is probably in the um, late 80s, people would uh, talk about how, you know, the game was not nearly as good as it used to be and how there'd been a deterioration in people going to the track. But it really, compared to today, it was a, a, a bustling hive of betting activity. And in those days, I was um, living in Canberra. And when I started there, the... The races were on every Saturday in, in Canberra, and then on the, the alternate day, they'd be on in Queanbeyan, which is a little country town just right outside the border of Canberra. Yep. So there was races every Saturday, and in the Canberra betting ring there, there was four bookmakers on the rails on the interstates, 19 on the in the outer, and a waiting list of about six or seven, and on the locals, four on the rails and about... 12 or 13 in the outer. It's so changed it, your business then? It, it changed unbelievably. And it was a very strong ring and there was lots of young aspiring bookmakers borrowing cash off each other to go to the <laughs> New South Wales Bookies Co-op to get their bookies license and pretend they had a lot more money than they did. And it was a really, it was a really great time. Cool. So tell us a bit about your journey and how your career then formed to become a professional punter. Well, uh, all the, the whole time I was a bookie, I was um, always what was called an opinion bookmaker. So a lot of other people um, are good at handling clients and getting the right people to bet with them and let them do whatever they want. And whereas I was always much more interested in um, being a uh, having an opinion on races and betting over some horses and betting under some horses. So I was always using the book as really a, a sort of a reverse style of punting. And I used to bet all, and I used to bet all the time as well. So that was always how I approached being a bookmaker. And um, I actually just backtracking a little bit, I had a job. I did subscribe to Warren Block and Don Scott's um, super form. And of course, Warren Block, who was in charge of that, lived in Canberra. And I went one day to renew my subscription to the office 
had a bit of a chat to him and then ended up working there for a few years. <laughs> so that was a great experience and got to meet Don Scott and got to talk to him on the phone and write articles and so worked on that side of it. Dream job for someone like yourself. Oh, it was a dream job. It really was. And um, some great experience. And that was really at the beginning of the whole um, computer revolution in, in racing. We used to enter all the results ourselves and then produce a magazine and send that to people. And on, I think it was a Monday or a Tuesday night, we would enter all the, uh, the nominations for the upcoming Saturday and then produce a sheet that we would send to people and they would be able to sort of scratch the horses that weren't accepted and use a sort of worksheet to work out their form of the different ratings. So I became a bookie, became a, a an opinion bookie, had a great time in Canberra, then moved to the Gold Coast, which was a really a very, very big sort of centre of bookmaking. Laurie Bricknell was there. He probably was at the time the biggest bookie in the world. Terry Page was on the rails, a, a real sort of um, legend of Australian bookmaking. Lloyd Merlihan was there, who's still a legend of Australian bookmaking. So they were yep. really exciting times. And during that time that I was at the Gold Coast, the, the internet really started to get going. And the crowd seemed to drop off a bit. There was also on uh, telephone betting, which I think was a seemed like a great idea at the time. But often these with the internet and telephone betting, what ended up happening was um, there was less and less need for people to go to the races. So I, I think I saw the writing on the wall. And and in those days, it was a very um, it was quite a restrictive thing. You weren't really allowed to take any time off from being a bookie. You had to write an application into the race club and ask for a week off here, a week off there. It was, And so the relentlessness of it was a little bit much. I lived in Byron Bay, had to drive an hour and a bit to get to the races each Saturday. And I decided sort of around the year 2000 or 2002, it might have been, that I would um, stop being a bookie for a while and just concentrate on punting. So you've been a pro punter now for almost two decades. Went out on your own and became a pro punter in the early 2000s. So how has racing and the betting landscape changed since you first started out? The change has really been extraordinary. And the pace of change in the last 10 years has been particularly extraordinary. You know, with the with the internet coming and people being able to bet online definitely changed things a lot. I think one of the most significant, I think there's been a perfect storm of, uh, of, of negative in influences for punters in general in the last 20 years. I think the internet coming was one thing. With that, it brought a lot of the, the English corporates to Australia. Yep. I think the fact that most of those have been um, registered in the Northern Territory was a huge blow um, for punters. I think it's when uh, Mark Reed first went there with uh, Darwin All Sports, it was a real boon for punting and a, and a great thing. But, uh, but the fact that all these places are registered in, in the Northern Territory has meant that there's not really anybody in that bureaucracy in the Northern Territory that really understood about betting. Yep. I think that combined with that, when I was a bookmaker and uh, during all my younger life, the income stream for racing came uh, primarily from the TAB and that income stream came from the paramutual part of the TAB. The TAB wasn't a bookmaker in those days. And the race clubs got their income stream um, from bookmaker turnover. So the, the stewards were, and I think this is a very significant thing, the stewards at the races, particularly the betting stewards, they were primarily interested in what was right for punters. 
if you're a bookmaker in those times and a punter made a complaint to the betting steward and you saw the betting steward walking up to your stand with the punter in tow, you knew 100% he was going to be on the side of the punter. Yep. If the punter said he was betting 7 to 1, that you, you weren't, it didn't matter. They were just on the side of the punter. I think once the tab became a corporate bookmaker, the whole attitude um, towards punters by stewards completely changed. And the closeness of um, racing associations like Racing New South Wales and, and RVL, the close relationship that they had with the tab now meant they had a very close relationship with bookmakers. Stewards, particularly in the time of um, Ray Murray and Terry Bailey and whatever else, they saw themselves really as suddenly the protectors of bookmakers rather than the protectors of punters. So punters these days really have nobody to turn to. If you feel that you've been um, uh, shortchanged or got a bad deal from a bookmaker or something's wrong, you have no one really to turn to. You can't, there's no anyone who's ever tried to put a complaint into the Northern Territory government about one of the corporate bookmakers yep. will know that the person you talk to has no idea about what you're talking about. Yeah, I was just going to ask. They've never about had that. a bet in their life. Yeah, there's not they're, much success. They're, they're not. Is it? They're, oh, it's hopeless. And there was a, 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 a there's been a disinterest in New South Wales stewards in looking after the um, looking after the rights of punters. Combined with that, you had Peter Volandis taking over in New South Wales, who may have done a lot of great things for racing, but one thing he's been steadfast about is that he has an attitude that it, the percentages bet by bookmakers is an irrelevance to punters and has seen punters as just a huge income stream for race. So there has been a, a perfect storm. And where we are today is that really there is, there's nobody that punters can turn to to try and get a better deal or indeed get a fair deal with their betting. So that's been a, a very dramatic change that I've seen. So in particular, the New South Wales relationship with TAB is a, a big factor there, do you think? Oh, a huge factor. You know, I used to bang my head against the brick wall trying to talk to Terry Griffin, who was the betting steward in New South Wales, about getting fair fluctuations sent off the course. You know, um, it went from the price had to be on three boards to be recognised as a as a, a price that was being bet to the median price that was being bet, and there was just no interest in looking after in looking after punters and getting proper fluctuations sent off the course and the same situation applies now and that's because the focus of the betting stewards and the chief stewards changed from being let's look after the punter and let's make sure those dreadful bookmakers don't take advantage of punters to let's look after the tab and the tab was the biggest bookmaker in australia still is the biggest bookmaker in Australia. And still today, we see the situation with the fluctuations uh, is the same, where the SP will be $4.20 and you will look on dynamic odds and see that five bookies were betting $4.40 yep. or $4, and two bookies were betting $4.60. Yep. It happens 365 days a year. And the same situation with, with the deductions, where you have deductions charged on top of other deductions you will have the second favorite come out on a friday which might have been which might have been um five to two and now the third favorite is five to two and it comes out on a saturday morning and the deductions taken out at five to two there was a race at kembler on um uh, melbourne cup day last year where the official deductions were 132 <laughs> percent because the, the horses just keep coming out at different times. And yeah. that's not a totally unusual occurrence. Not that long ago in, in Adelaide, where if you backed the winner and copped all the deductions, you got 83 cents for your dollar. Yeah. It's such a great well, example of the huge problem. Huge problem. And there's nobody, to, to, there's nobody to discuss it with because, A, the people in the Northern Territory don't understand, and, B, the people at, let's say, Racing New South Wales, they don't care. The people at RVL, they don't care. 
why don't they care? Like you've mentioned the tab relationship, but surely there's other underlying factors as well. I've heard a famous interview that um, Peter Volandis did on 2KY or, or Sky where he said the average punter doesn't know the difference between 115 and 125%. Yep. Now, if that's the attitude you take towards um, what's good for punters and you only see them as an income stream that you can just keep taxing, then why would you care whether the deduction should have been 20 cents or 15 cents or 16 cents? It's an irrelevance. The same situation applies to, we all know that some people get a, a, a live feed of the races and other huge Betters are allowed to cancel the bets 15 seconds into the race. That affects the average dividend by over the over a year by 10 cents. How could you get anyone to care if the horse should have paid $4.20, but it's only paying $4.10? Yep. If your attitude is punters don't, won't notice or don't care, and the average punter probably doesn't notice or care between $4.20 and $4.10 if they back the winner, if that's your attitude then it's very hard to get any anyone to really take seriously what's a very big issue for racing. Is there a solution you've got in mind or is it getting someone at the top in these racing bodies who cares for the punter? Well, I think that's obviously the solution. If To have people involved in the administration of racing actually seeing the long-term benefits to punters as being, as being something worth concentrating on but at the moment, it's a just a, a wasteland of, of people who really don't care. I think the pervading attitude in most of the uh, racing organisations in Australia is that um, punters are sort of a, a, a necessary but unpleasant part of the racing industry. If they could find an income stream that would come from somewhere else, I'm sure they would <laughs> rather take it from there. But uh, at the moment, they're sort of um, saddled with the punters, and so they take it from the punters. But I don't feel a lot, of, uh, a lot of love for punters in the in the racing bodies. Is there any other solution you can think of, like you know, like a punters union? What kind of roads could punters go down to try and achieve a better result? Well, I've heard people talk about let's have a strike on one day and nobody bet to show our displeasure. But I'm not sure you'd get many people involved in that and, and of course one of the great problems with any of that is a huge number of punters don't have any expectation of winning yep. Yep. so you're talking to quite a small subset of people who are trying to make a profit out of it and a smaller subset than there used to be certainly 15 or 20 years ago when i was a bookie there was a, a lot of people at the races who were extremely hard to beat if you could beat them at all they had an expectation that they were going to the races to buy and make money it seems a lot of what's promoted now is fun punting and I think a lot of people don't have any expectation of making money. They have an expectation of having a, a, a good day out with a bit of fun betting and let's face it, it's, it's everything is being done to get rid of anybody who has any expectation of, of winning on the punt. Why has that mindset changed, do you think? Is it purely because of the promotion of a day at the races being fun or...? Well, no, I think that the main um, the significant factor in that has been that the British corporates came to Australia, bought up all the Australian betting houses and employed the same tactics that they and the, the same methods that they employed in Britain for a long time, which is you root out anybody who doesn't lose uh, more than 8% on turnover and you get rid of them. And you just have a business model that's not like a giant poker machine. It, in fact, is a giant poker machine. You know, we saw a couple of weeks ago on Stakes Day at Flemington where the tab went down and a great number of the corporates couldn't result their bets on the day within a couple of hours because they didn't even have anyone obviously working there who could enter the results of the races. Yep. They've got their staff down to such a minimal amount that it runs like a poker machine, all automated. Get rid of anybody who doesn't lose more than 8% 8, 8 on turnover and just let it run its run its course. 
they literally only have one or two losing days a year. It's hard to be sort of um, motivating people into let's get into racing and let's really work out how we can win on the punt when if you if you start to win yeah, or make, break swear or don't lose enough. Exactly. One more thing while we're talking about the nitty-gritty of betting, what are your thoughts on the decision to go to dollar dividends? Well, it's a little bit of a co- – I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times on Twitter and got an absolute bagging for it. But um, in, in my mind, it was just a colossal mistake by – the bookmaking fraternity in Australia. It was a a, a, a total point of difference between um, the TAB and bookmakers. Betting of odds is understood universally all around the world, even in jurisdictions where they only have all tote betting like the United States. Um, when the race jumps, the odd displayed on the screen, not the dividends. It'll show a horse as being 2-1 or 3-1 or six to five as they say over there or eight to one it won't be being showed as a dividend anyone who's been to school and done statistics and probability or to university anywhere in the world knows about odds and the idea that australian um, odds in inverted commas are displayed as a return for a dollar is just seems silly to me the odds of a horse isn't $3, it's two to one. And Joe Blow in the street understands two to one or even money or a five to one chance. Uh, it just seemed like a crazy idea to let go of that historical difference and such a well-known part of bookmaking and of and of all games of chance. So why did they do that? I can't, can't remember why they did that. They did that because um, either they got hoodwinked into into doing it by the TAB or the people in charge of the Bookmakers Association was in New South Wales that led the charge, decided that young people, when they went to the races, looked at the tote board and saw a horse was paying $6 on the tote, but yeah. it was only five to one with the bookies <laughs> and <laughs> they were too stupid off. and thought, yeah, let's go and have our dollar on with the TAB. <laughs> now, it just was crazy, but that's where we've got to. I want to ask you about the point of consumption taxes as well and the ongoing heavy taxation on punters. It's obviously a, a big reason why they're able to fund these big races in New South Wales and the like, but what's your thoughts on the whole scenario of continually taking money away from punters? Well, that really does just all tie back into the um, the idea that, uh, and I'm not, I'm not picking on Peter Volandis specifically, but his attitude that punters don't know whether it's a 115 percent on the board or 125 that has led to the um, race fields legislation the point of consumption tax and we see now you can be it can be melbourne cup day it can be derby day it can be magic millions day it can be golden slipper day at nine o'clock on a saturday morning and they've been betting on these races since wednesday the percentages on all these races are 130 yep. percent now the point of consumption tax, the race fields legislation is not paid by the bookmaker. It's 100% paid by the punter. And the most extraordinary thing about it is that the people who put forward these um, taxes and think they're a great idea, virtually to a man, they're extremely conservative people in their own political leanings. And none of them would ever vote for the Labour Party. And when it comes to uh, elections, they'd be uh, you know, heartily against taxation and ideologically against taxation. Mm. Yet in this one instance, they think it's just a, a perfectly great idea to keep on taxing punters and getting all the income stream coming from taxes on punters. Well, in the end, it's it's the money will run out. Yeah, what's the tipping point? How long is it going to be sustainable this way? Well, that's a very good question. I don't know. Maybe punters are, are all stupid and it doesn't matter. I don't know. <laughs> but at 130%, you're certainly up against it. Yep. Makes it very difficult. So I wouldn't mind digging deeper into your own form analysis. So tell us about the areas and states and the niches that you have. I've always kept a, a detailed database where it's based on, I guess, 
a Scott style way of doing the races. And when I say that, I think that the the big thing um, with a, with that Scott attitude was to be able to uh, put a quantitative number on a qualitative analysis. So make a judgment on the quality of each individual race and to be able to give that a number. And I think that that's a very important thing of starting out and, and trying to make money out of punting or trying to develop a system that works. You need to be able to know the difference in the, between the different uh, classes of races and the difference of the quality even within that class. You'll see, uh, you know, a group one, there are group one races, but they're not all the same. You need to be able to... to in your own way, come up with a way of saying, I think this is a, a, a race of this quality and to give it a number that shows that. So um, one of the really significant things also is that people need to spend their time. Not everyone can keep a database and bet on all the races all around Australia and uh, on different states and it's very hard to have the time to do that unless you're devoting your whole life to it. People need to think about what gives me the best bang for my buck. And I think that um, I hear a lot of people uh, talking about how important it is watching the videos. And I meet a lot of um, young aspiring punters and they always say, you know, I, I spend a lot of time watching the videos well, they must like to spend a lot of time just sitting on their own to get away from their family <laughs> because it's tremendously time consuming watching races over and over again. And I think that it's a skill that not very many people have. And I think that part of that, um, uh, I think it's an important thing to, it's more important to be able to have a handle on what is the actual class of this race and what is this horse capable of doing we'll often see a video where horse a may look unlucky and but if you know the capacity of horse a you may well find that it's actually unto the best of its ability a good friend of mine used to say i always worry that when that horse has been trapped in a pocket that the pocket is going as fast as the horse can go. Now, <laughs> yeah. I think that that's something that's, it's an important thing you need to know. Yeah. No, it, it might have looked unlucky, but that's just about as good as that horse can go. Yeah. And so I think time is best spent on finding, on working out the quality of races. Is it fair to say you don't watch many videos or? I do, look, I, I have someone who watches the races for me and makes a few notes. Yeah. Uh, but also the other thing is, I think that um, it, it's a very critical thing to understand that backing horses that are overbet in the market will lead you to the poorhouse, even if the mark, even if those horse, even if you're getting the right information. If a horse you've marked uh, without ever looking at the video is, you might have priced at eight to one but the video watchers have all seen that it was a bit unlucky last start and yep. and it's four to one, yep. but that price should be six to one. It's over bet in the market. So it's just, I just think it's a zero sum game or worse for most people spending a lot of time watching, watching videos. And there's some real expert video watchers out there. You would need to spend many years doing it before you'd be better than they are at it. And there's an optical illusion a lot of the time. A horse will seem to really fly home in a very poor maiden, and people talk about what a turn of foot it was. But if you analyse the times, you'll yeah. see that, in fact, it was actually a slow race. And most people, what there's a great optical illusion in virtually every race every day is people talk about horses finishing very quick, very flying home but virtually every horse is going slower in the yep. last section of the race than they are in the middle section. Yeah, just going past some slow ones. Yeah, exactly. I think that that business of horses being overbet in the market is a very, very important one to for people to conceptualise if you're trying to uh, make a profit of ra at racing. For example, if you went to a, a two-up game with a group of friends and they all identified that the the tosser was doing something weird with his hand and it was making tails come up more often than heads. 
and someone was bookmaking on it and they also knew this and now uh, head uh, tails was four to six and heads was six to four but you were completely blind to this reality and you just kept backing heads at six to four and it still came up 55 percent of the time you would win yeah they would be right there was a bias for the tails but the market overbet it so and i think that that's a very very critical thing that people don't understand people are always arguing about track bias or it would have happened or if this horse had got a better run or it all depends on how if the market is over influenced by these things and if there's one place their market is definitely over influenced by it's the horse that looked to be unlucky last start yep, just ask the people who back for delia <laughs> there's a few horses like that i think <laughs> absolutely um without giving away too many of your secrets like it sounds like your database doesn't factor in the videos and unlucky runs as much as others might it probably doesn't factor in those things as much as uh, others might but by having a um, rating next to each horse's run you're able to identify where a horse might have dropped off and watch the rate see i'd rather do the form and then watch each individual run and go back and see if there's something a reason why that horse might have underperformed yep on the video watching tell us about the 80 20 principle well i think that that um, principle is in all walks of life and particularly applies to where you want to put your time into uh, doing the form or to betting you need to focus on the things that are giving you the maximum amount of income like i think most people would do better on betting on a, a Saturday than they do betting midweek. So you should focus most of your attention and most of your uh, turnover on where you're getting the, the best bang for your buck. And you will get, I think the markets are generally uh, more competitive on a Saturday. You've got the on-course bookies who are still having a bit of a go. I might just say that um, amongst all the corporates that are out there at the moment, the outlier as far as bookmaking is definitely top sport. They run by Lloyd Merlihan, a, a great Australian bookmaker, and they really have a go and they let people on no matter whether you're a winning punter or a losing punter. So I think that Saturdays offer you the the best opportunity to be winning. Yeah, you never hear a bad word about top sport, so big thumbs up. No, with good reason. All right, so obviously you wait a lot of your betting time into Saturdays then, is that fair? Saturdays is the definitely the day where you can increase your turnover and get more money on, for sure. Like, Better class racing. How do you like to bet generally? Is it early or late? Corporates, Betfair, tote? Well, look, things have changed a lot in the last um, in the last 10 or 15 years, and really dramatically. I can remember there was a man worked at Sporting Bet called Brad Spicer, and I rang him after the races one Saturday, and really gave him a mouthful because he would only bet me to win 10,000 on the races that were run that day. And I thought this was very un-Australian and a, a real blight on racing. Well, fast forward 15 years and- <laughs> You love that. I, exactly, you'd be down on your knees blessing anyone who would let you on to win like that. Yeah. And then when the corporates came in, of course, there was a bit of a trick in finding people who would be able to still keep betting and suggesting to them they might like to have a few bets for you. Well, they put a stop to that by, I think, making it illegal, certainly making it very hard to get paid out, uh, being able to, whatever tricks they could come up with. So betting early, if there was no um, restriction and you could get on for whatever you like. I think betting early probably still offers the best opportunity for people. If you're a small punter, if you can pick the mistakes and there are mistakes in those early markets, give them credit. The people who do those early markets on a Wednesday, they put them up within a few hours. They're it, a, usually a, a very good set overall, but it's impossible that they're not full of mistakes at the same time. So that's where the best opportunity lies, but also impossible to get on um, very much money in those, in those early markets. 
Winning Edge Investments is an independent provider of tips, ratings, and betting education on horse racing and sports, recruiting only the best full-time professional punters and expert analysts. Does your tipping service offer transparent posting of results every day using an achievable odds recording method? Do they offer a 120-page betting education pack with every membership? And do they provide a profit guarantee, loyalty bonus credits, refer a friend bonuses, and special insider discounts to valued members? If not, head over to winningedgeinvestments.com for a different, better experience. Treat your betting like a business and invest intelligently with Winning Edge Investments. All right, um, I'd like to just go into some general racing topics. Which are the best horses you've seen in your time? Very interestingly, probably the three uh, best horses I've seen, certainly the three highest rating horses in the history of my database have been Might and Power on the day he won the Corfu Cup by seven and a half lengths and when he won the Queen Elizabeth Stakes by ten and a half lengths that day, I think it was, and beat the horses that had run the Quinella in the Doncaster the previous Saturday. And, of course, Black Caviar and Winx. They'd, they'd be the, the three highest-rated horses I've ever had. The arguments that go on between um, people on who was the greatest horse of all time and this, I think it often depends on what day you're talking about. Like, I'm not sure that any horse would have beaten Might and Power when he won the Caulfield Cup that day, but there were days when he was off his game. Yep. There were... There, been days when Winx has been off a game. You know, the day she just narrowly got up and beat Red Excitement that day at Randwick, I think it was. And when she just got there to beat Funstar, I know she missed the start. But so on I think one of the incredible things about Caviar and Winx was even when they were off their game, they still found found a way to win. But having said that, they primarily raced in wait for age races against inferior horses all the time. So that's been a big change that I've witnessed in the time I've been doing the form. The focus used to be on the, the great handicap races and now the focus is on the on the wait for age races. Have you got a favourite out of but those three? Would be the, oh, I think because I was um, bookmaking when Martin Powell won the Melbourne Cup when it was a huge result for me, I think he <laughs> was... Better. He's probably my favourite horse. And just doing it from the front and having said that, Black Caviar's winning the new market was equally as dynamic. And I think it was a great shame for Winx's legacy that they spent the last few years just running in the same seven or eight or nine races every year and not testing her in in some other way. But she was a her wins in the Cox Plate were phenomenal and and other days where she, you know, really gapped her rivals. I must say also, um, there was, I think, Hariba when he won the Australia Day Stakes at um, Flemington one day by six lengths was an was a really an incredible performance. And when I was a kid, I used to back Kingston Town every time it started. And um, so, and I was at Randwick one day when in, when he won, in fact, just beating, I think, a horse called Northern Reward just by a nose in a wait for age race. So a lot of the great champions of the past did get beaten quite a bit, whereas we've seen this phenomenon in recent times in Australia where, you know, between them, Winks and Black Caviar won 58 races straight. So it's a, it's a definitely a new phenomenon. We don't really have a, a Winks or a Black Caviar at the moment, do we? So can you see where that next superstar might come from? <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's an interesting thing, punting. In one of those very early books, Don Scott did write about um, getting onto champion racehorses and backing them at every start, and it's it, it's actually not a bad idea. You know, I did back used to back, uh, despite the short odds, Black Caviar and Winks at every start, and it, overall you do you do definitely show a, a profit backing those good horses in those, despite their short odds. As for finding out, uh, being able to predict who the next one's going to be. It's a trick, and off the top of my head, there's certainly none of the three-year-olds around you would be uh, at the moment thinking that they're going to go on and be the next Black Caviar or Winks. And we have this phenomenon now in Australia where the Colts go to stud after they're three, 
there's no steroids for the stallion for the uh, geldings to race as many times as they used to race in in a preparation and so we see these totally dominant mares that seem to be the ones that can run these huge winning streaks together yeah or they go to hong kong like classic legend exactly that's right well not even just like classic legend you can see a impressive maiden winner at the provincials and it will go to hong kong and they'll get half a million or three three quarters of a million dollars for it yeah half the like life. there's a lot of horses being exactly a lot of horses being sold to hong kong that's right a few other avenues i wanted to get down your thoughts on stewarding the comparison between high profile trainers and jockeys versus how the bush trainers and jockeys are, are treated it's a tough job stewing there's no doubt about it there seems to be far less of an appetite to um, go after the big trainers and the big jockeys than they used to be. Like I think back to, you know, not very long ago, um, Jim Cassidy was outed twice during his career. Now it's a very, very rare thing to see a a high profile jockey um, outed on a handling charge. And if they are outed, it's always they um, made an error of judgment and they're usually given, you know, six weeks or something. Whereas in the old days, you'd, you'd be given 12 months. It just doesn't seem to be much stomach for it. Um, there seems to be much more stomach for um, having a go at the inexperienced apprentice for going too fast. We've seen that. Yep. Not that long ago in Melbourne, where two apprentices apparently went too fast in front on a horse, and Tom Sherry got outed in um, at Wyong for going too fast on some horse, still in front with 200 toe, but not much stomach for the horse that flops out the back and just runs on nicely. I, I, it, it, and I understand in years in years gone by, the stewards had far greater powers, and now there's avenues of appeal and. I just wonder whether they don't think it's worth it. And I and it's the same with the high, high profile trainers. Like there's been a string of trainers um, who've been outed for cobalt, often for horses that by and large horses that didn't run a place in whatever race they were in. Mm, yep. And yet, and I'm not criticizing Chris Weller, he's a great trainer. His effort on Epsom Day when he won I think six out of the six out of six in Sydney and when the Turnbull stakes to boot in Melbourne is like a Bradmanesque training performance as far as I'm concerned. But the fact is Janub won the Metropolitan, tested positive for Lasix and he got a thirty thousand dollar fine. It's hard to understand how these things exist in the in the same racing sphere. There's such a desire now in being a team player whether it's with your racing New South Wales or being on Sky, which is owned by the tab, or everyone wants to really champion the team and the team racing, that I think there's just no, not really much stomach for making a case out of the high profile trains. On the other hand, they have done it with Darren Weir and Robert Smurton in Melbourne. So who knows? I don't know. If you ask a lot of bigger pundits, they'd like to see some of the high-profile trainers and jockeys get asked some more questions. I don't, I don't think it's a good look for racing when, like, for example, the right on joviality on Melbourne I was, Cup I was, I was going to bring that one up. I thought, I thought that was lingering in the back of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was mind-boggling for the leading rider to at Flemington where the straight, a huge long straight, racing against some very poor horses decides to go up on the fence and, and ride for like uh, from 600 when the option was there to peel out wide. Now, I'm not saying that James McDonald did it deliberately. I don't think that there was any skullduggery involved, but it certainly was a ride that needed, the questions needed to be asked. And if people are going to be suspended for making poor errors of judgment, like I just watched the replay of a, Noel Callow's ride at whoop whoop Benalla in the 25th of September where he's been charged for not giving a horse every chance, you'd be very hard pressed to say that there was a difference in the two rides. Now the stewards have just decided Benalla 
on a Friday, Noel Callow, this is a good one to show that we're doing something. But on Melbourne Cup Day, I don't think they wanted the press of the leading rider being questioned over his ride on, on the favourite. Do you think it might have been different be if, he, if there was a, an apprentice jockey on Joviality? Oh, for sure. I do. And if it was a lesser known pre- uh, rider, I do. I think, it prob- I think it probably would have been different, yeah. I think well, questions man. need to be asked because, let's face it, if I'm, and I'm again, I'm definitely not saying there was any impropriety by James McDonald, but in another case where another jockey rode the same way and there was impropriety, what's to stop them from doing it again the week after or the week after that? Like the, the saying, justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. Mm. I think in this case, it wasn't seen to be done. Yeah, and I think all punters want is consistency, so they're not scratching their head over which rides are, are looked at and scrutinised exactly. and ones which are overlooked. So Exactly, and there's a general acceptance now, I think, of horses early in their campaigns being flopped out the back and allowed to run on well, and it's a nice sort of warm-up for the cup sort of thing. I don't think that there's much attention paid to those rides. Yep. Well, we're on jockeys. Um, your thoughts on the increase in minimum weights for jockeys it seems to be creeping up each year, particularly in Victoria. What do you think about it and what are some alternatives? Well, I think that um, Racing New South Wales have just got it exactly right at the moment. They've dropped the minimum back down to, um, I think, 52. I'm not even sure that you can't ride lighter than that. I think that the race needs to be handicapped on its merits and if your right handicap weight is 48 or 49 and you can find an apprentice that is happy to ride at 48 or 49 or you can get Dean Yendall who can ride at 49, why does your horse have to carry 54? Mm-hmm. Or in the state, in the case in Victoria at the moment, with this crazy thing with COVID of having the minimum 56. So if your rightful weight in that race uh, in the uh, before the increase was 54 now you're carrying 56 but the horse that was handicapped on 56 and a half it's still carrying 56 and a half yeah. every horse down the bottom of the weights in in victoria every owner of those horses is just being penalized for absolutely no good reason at all like we saw over the carnival day after day after day where there was lower weights for bigger race i i think in the caulfield cup 13 or 14 horses carried 53 or less. And then the next day, the benchmark races are on at the provincials and the minimum is 56. These are the same jockeys riding on the next day. Makes well, it, it's the, impossible the 56 for the minimum in Victoria is crazy. I'm sure there's a reason why they do it, but what's your rate? Well, I'm, I'm sure that the reason that they do it is that the wealthy jockeys are so powerful with such a strong lobby group that of course it's better for the if the minimum if the minimum is 56 because most of the horses are carrying 58 59 60 61 mm. there's a lot more rides for them yep. most of the most of the big jockeys in Australia are quite heavyweight jockeys now Craig Williams would be a, and Karen McAvoy can get down to the lower weights but it gives them a lot more opportunities. Uh, it's just a terribly unfair situation in Victoria. I just, I really don't understand why they're, why they're going on with it. So, but in New South Wales, they've got it perfectly right. And I think if your horse is handicapped correctly and you're happy to find a rider to ride it at that weight, you should be able to. But if you choose to put Hugh Bowman on, if its handicap is 50, but you say, no, I'd rather carry 56 and put Hugh Bowman on, when you declare riders, say, no, we're happy to have 56. We'll have Hugh Bowman. But if you choose J- Dean Yendall, carry 50. I don't understand why those horses are penalised down the bottom. With the differences between New South Wales and Victoria, is it another good example of why there should be some national cohesion for the sport? I'm not sure about national cohesion. I think that um, competition is good in all things i think it's been disappointing in the last couple of years that so much of the competition in new south wales seems to have been um purposely directed at uh negatively affecting the victorian spring carnival which is the 
jewel in the crown of Australian racing. I think some of these races that are on have really, for example, the yes, yes, yes stakes or the, the sort of the race that's run a couple of weeks after the um, Everest, that's $1.3 million bonus if you've already run in the Everest. Well, uh, that is just clearly uh, an example of um, attacking that sprint race on the last day of the Melbourne Carnival. Yep. With no good Darling. reason for doing it, other than to keep those horses away and may, and weaken their carnival, I don't, I, I can't say I think that that's a good way to be going about things. Having said that, the Everest has has been quite a success, and I think the Golden Eagle has been a a phenomenal success, and it will be a, a big race in years to come, uh, grow in stature. So some of those things that have been done by Racing New South Wales even with not by possibly with the best intention, have um, been very successful. Yeah. I want to get your thoughts on track conditions and how they're managed. Always a lot of talk about deliberate overwatering of tracks and rail bias, inaccurate or not regularly updated track conditions in the days before a race. What are some of the solutions you have and what are some of the main gripes you have with track conditions? <laughs> Well, it's just been um, it's just such been such a big issue for the last ten or so years, maybe even going back a little bit further than that. I think it started with Terry Watson at um, Caulfield. He was the first one to start giving out the track as dead in the morning rather than good. And I know one of the great um, track curators said to me one day just before he retired, when I first started here. If I produced the track out uh, like it like it was the the highway just out the front of this race course, people would pat me on the back. Now, that would be sacrilege to have anything like that. Now, I'm not um, suggesting we should have necessarily fast or rock hard tracks, but I've spoken to a lot of course curators over the last number of years about it. Not one of them has been supportive of the watering of tracks to have them as a, a dead track on race day. We've got this situation now where the, um, we've changed from calling a, a track when it's a, a four from being dead. We now say that that's good, so that it sounds better. We also have the race clubs tell the uh, course curators that the, the um, track should be prepared to be a a good four and that's the perfect racing surface well the fact of the matter is the skill that and the equipment that they have in on metropolitan tracks for watering and producing a, a good four is vastly better than they do in provincial mm. tracks so we see these huge swings between uh, exactly what track is given out as a good four on race morning and in fact regularly it can be anywhere from a two to a six and it happens all the time in fact i think one day at hawkesbury recently the track mail was given out as a four or five and it was a heavy eight and they were coming down the outside fence because no we see time you the track reports which used to be well worth listening to on sky racing in in the morning at 6 30 it's just good four good four good four good four everyone's a good four it doesn't even, it really doesn't mean anything because everyone wants to say it's a good four. If you've been told good four is the perfect surface, then you're inclined to say it's a good four. I think it's probably too late for a solution. I think that the, it's just the overwhelming idea in the industry is that soft tracks are good and that that's what we should be racing on. I think every course curator will tell you that it makes um, preparing tracks going forward mm, yep. very difficult if you're always racing on uh, water affected surfaces it creates biases it means the tracks get chopped up it's hard to keep them going for the, for the whole of the carnivals the and if the overwhelming narrative is that soft it, it's better to have tracks soft than to have them good and that what punters like don't doesn't matter it's very hard to turn it around. And a lot of the narrative is just is just wrong. A lot of the narrative is about how horses can't handle a, 
a good track, but the Ohio horse gets sent to Hong Kong and they race almost exclusively on good and fast tracks. Mm. The same in Japan. And this business of, oh, well, now we have all the imported horses and they're soft boned and they need the soft tracks is just total nonsense because uh, throughout my whole life, the great size in Australia have been European horses like Sir Tristram and Dane Hill and uh, these horses didn't come from Australia. They were imported. Mm, yep. All of the thoroughbred is an English horse. It's the same breed of horse racing in Japan and Hong Kong and Australia and England. It's not a different breed. So, but it's become just a, a narrative that's believed by people. So I know that in Hong Kong, if they don't produce, if the track isn't good, the curator needs to present a written explanation to the club as to why it wasn't good because they know that good tracks promote turnover and that punters like betting on good tracks. And you see it here, the turnover declines if the track's slow and is even worse if the track's heavy. Yep. So it's it's not a smart move. And if you or I owned Randwick Racecourse and our income came from maximising turnover the first thing we'd do is have a, a good three track every day. Watering tracks artificially must cost race clubs quite a lot of money as well, not only for the water but for the resources to put the water on the tracks. Yeah, you, the, I'm sure the expenses are huge and then you, you can't find those figures anywhere, what the actual cost of the water is. Yeah. I know that in Brisbane over the last year they were – you're trucking in water to put it in the dam in Doombin. Yep. And the strange thing is that uh, for 30 years, you used to get the paper out in the summer and in for the Brisbane races and write down at the top of it, weather fine, track fast. Yep. And you would have these huge <laughs> fields in Brisbane. Yep. But now, strangely, Queensland, South Australia, they virtually never race on a good track anymore. At Doombin, they've gone to really trying to have it as a dead five all the time. And the same at Morfordville. Unless they race on the parks track, it's not uncommon for Morfordville to actually be a six on the day. Yep. All right, on to another bugbear of punters. Um, the fact that horses can be accepted in two different states or meetings and they're not scratched until race day, when in some cases they've already raced or clearly can't mm. in two races mm. at once. <laughs> Your thoughts on this one? Well, it's just another extension of the fact that really nobody cares about the punter. Nobody, the race clubs can't be bothered when a horse is won on a Friday afternoon. If they've won a maiden at uh, Maui on the Friday and they're in a, a maiden at Ballarat on the Sunday and they're $2.50 at Ballarat on the Sunday, they'll still be in there on the Saturday afternoon. They've already won the maiden because RVL doesn't care. Who cares? They let it it's only the punters that are going to pay the price for that. And and a lot of trainers can't be bothered scratching the horse. I think there might even be a fee if they scratch it rather than RVL scratching it. Horses are in Melbourne and they're already been floated down from Sydney. The trainer can't be bothered scratching it from the race in Sydney because who cares? Yeah. I think the, the, the overriding attitude of who cares is a problem because it is the punter that actually funds the industry. Do you think they just try and pour more resources into things which don't affect the punter too often? I think that there's, I think, look, I just think that the, people take it upon themselves to feel as if they're purists in racing, the same way as the purist people took it upon themselves to purists at the trots. We talked about the trots earlier, and people might be surprised to know that the, the crowd at um, Harrow Park on a Friday night going back 30 or 40 years, used to be bigger than it would be at Rose Hill on a Saturday. The purists in their wisdom at the trots decided that there shouldn't be standing starts anymore because it's clear that what we need to have is mobile starts and give everyone a fair chance. But a lot of the interest in the trots was in the handicapping and coming off mobile start. Now, we mentioned Hondo Grattan earlier. It was the first horse to win in the Dominion twice. The second time he won it, he won off 30 metres handicap. Well, the Blacks of Fake won the Dominion five times, I think. The purists think that's great. 
just like all the money used to be, the big money used to be in handicap racing in racing, I think one, when Farlight won the Melbourne Cup, it might have been worth 10 times more than the cost plate. Now all the big money is in weight for age racing. And you see a lot of the great handicaps have been turned into weight for age races. Mm. The TJ Smith used to be a handicap, now it's a weight for age. The Doombin 10,000 handicap, now it's weight for age. The Goodwood used to be a handicap, now it's weight for age. It's boring. But the purists think that the that they've done that they've really shown how superior they are in that they've made it into this into something that everyone can love but they forget that it's punting that, that drives racing and they sometimes don't want to accept that fact like i've looked at a few things recently on articles written by reasonably knowledgeable people how do we get people back to the track and we have to focus more on the good stories and we have to focus more on the horse. These things are great to focus on, and I'm not saying they aren't important, but you won't find a more beautiful horse than in the equestrian at the Olympics. You won't find a better spectacle than the cross-country equestrian at the Olympics. It's beautiful, and the horses are magnificent, and the connection between between horse and rider is phenomenal, but nobody watches it. The reason people are interested in racing is not solely, but primarily because of the betting. Yep. And I think that people, they don't want to admit that. It seems like some sort of dirty secret, but unless you can promote the excitement, like I, I, I remember seeing just last year, I think it was Ben, one of the others from racing.com, and they'd back Val and Declare, and they'd obviously backed it um, in the futures market, and there was a shot of them giving each other a massive high five when it hit the line. That's exciting, and that's what people are drawn to when, they, when they're drawn to racing. I'm not saying that the other things aren't important, but if you continually move away from that focus and act like racing's a great place to go for a party or to drink champagne the, the game's going to die out just the way it died out with the mobile starts you need people to be excited about backing winners and not think that that's a dirty secret part of racing it's actually the engine room and the lifeblood of racing do you think more should be done to educate young punters or young enthusiasts to get more involved in punting and more educated and informed about punting? Well, see, it's also it's a it's a very difficult question because clearly that would be a good thing for the future of the sport and for the future of racing. If they made the percentages one hundred and ten percent, and everyone had a great chance of winning and the good punters would win and here's how you know you ran a master class. i know at the star casino one time dom Byrne did a master class and people would come and try and uh, learn about it that'd be great also society's attitudes have changed towards punting and towards gambling in general one of the great problems with racing is that it didn't do a good enough job at differentiating itself from are the forms of gaming, like poker machines. Mm. Like we often get clumped in together with people who are betting on, they're not actually betting or gambling, they're just gaming at the Push, on poker buttons. machines because there's no prospect of winning. And people see betting on the horses as similar to that. And so it's a little bit on the nose. So I guess the people are trying to be careful in race clubs. Let's not promote the gambling aspect too far. <laughs> Even though it but funds the, the game. same token, even though it funds the game. Yep. That's right. Yeah, well, we've spoken about some of the challenges the industry is facing. Can you tell us about the solutions to some of these problems? Well, yeah, we don't want it to be all um, doom and gloom, even though I think it's important to uh, be able to critique, you know, whatever situation you're looking at and, and do it honestly. I think one of the problems with one of the issues with racing is that there isn't really much journalistic um, critiquing of what goes on, perhaps too much rah rahing. But having said that, 
there are some tremendous positives that have come out of racing in the last, you know, 15 or 20 years. I think the um, the broadcast of racing on the on the television has improved out of sight. I think the racing.com coverage is great with some lots of young guys that are obviously keen on racing and keen on having a bet and the sky saturday coverage is you know sensational so there's definitely some great things have, have happened in racing in recent times as far as um solutions to some of the real issues that i think confront racing and will confront racing going forward i don't think um I think it's a mistake if people think that um, just by, you know, fertilising the ground and tilling it and extracting as much as you can out of punters' pockets over the last 10 or 15 years, that that situation necessarily will go forward. So I think that there needs to be some, you know, reasonably dramatic changes going forward. And if I was, um, if I was put in charge, if I was put in charge of uh, racing as the sole administrator, I think um, one of the first things I would do would be make all the corporates have to be licensed in the states that they're actually betting in yep. so that they come under the jurisdiction of that state. I think that um, the minimum uh, bet should be raised midweek to $5,000 and on Saturdays, $10,000, which would be a considerable hike. But Top Sport, for example, does bet people to win $10,000 on a Saturday. I think the nonsense of um, that you can only back the horse once, it should be outlawed. So there needs to be some strong stewarding of what's going on with the online bookmakers so that they comply with those new bet limits and comply with the regulations that are in and that there needs to be penalties if they don't comply. I think this business of you log on and it's $3.90 and you type in the bet at $3.90 and then it says no bet declined, it's now $3.50. There needs to be some uh, way around that. Um, I think in an ideal world, I think if, again, if I was made the ruler of um, the betting landscape, I'd ban the um, online bookmakers from offering uh, tote dividends. I think that that has just seen a total cannibalisation of the tote pools, particularly in um, exotic betting. Um, I would ban all kickbacks to the um, huge betting syndicates. You know, a lot of these places are getting a 7 to 10% kickback, and a lot of them have the facility to cancel their bets 15 seconds into a race, which is another area that I think should be looked at and stamped out straight away. And anyone tells who tells you that's not the case is just not telling the truth. So the average tote player is betting into a market against A, people that are probably smarter than them, B, people who are getting a 7 to 10% kickback on their bet, and see they can cancel their bets 15 seconds into the race. Well, it, it's impossible to win. So the tote needs a complete overhaul. I think if um, the online bookmakers were banned from uh, offering those uh, tote odds, that you could see a rejuvenation of uh, paramutual betting. So are you saying the tote would just be available through tab, but it wouldn't be available through corporates? I don't think it should be available through corporates unless the corporates uh, have to put the money back into the tab. Yep, fair point. Now, anyone who, th who thinks that having a national tote pool under the current circumstances is a good idea has just not thought about the idea properly. One of the only um, places where there is some value in betting at the moment is betting best of the best. Well, under the current scheme, if you had one national tote pool, that value would, would disappear. Yep, that's a great but point. I think if you stop the corporates betting the tote odds, the idea of going to a national pool would have some merit if the tab takeout was reduced to 10%, or I think in um, fields of under 10, 1% per runner. So if there was a field of five, it'd be 105% 
field of seven, 107, but in the Melbourne Cup, 110. I think you would see a, a huge um, rejuvenation of paramutual betting in Australia if that was the case. And it would be a, a very vibrant market. And if the kickbacks were stopped uh, to the to the to the whales, I think that's a very important thing. So, what's the likelihood of these things coming to fruition, and what needs to happen? Well, in the short term, some of them aren't the the suggestions I had for the tab aren't very likely, but they may become more likely as the pools continue to dwindle. Like, I don't. It does just doesn't get much press how much smaller the tote pools are today than they used to be 20 years ago. But some of the um, things I suggested there as far as regulating online bookmakers could come in tomorrow. Yep. If the people who were overseeing racing, if those boards were filled with grassroots people who actually understood racing, yep. you know, by, by punters, by small time trainers, by people who make their living out of racing, who would like to see a rejuvenation of those things. And the really for companies with um, um, uh, whose assets are, and, and, and where betting houses that are worth, you know, billions of dollars are only required to bet you to win $1,000 it's just so small it's 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 ridiculous really i think the minimum bet really needs to be raised i think that there needs to be uh, the, the, all these places licensed in these states so that there is jurisdiction by the stewards in those states with things like deductions and the only being able to back the horse once that really that all those things are, are, are terrible for turnover and a terrible for punters. On that point, are you saying to be able to back the horse twice to the max limit of ten thousand, say on a Saturday, or beyond the ten thousand? Well, I don't. I don't quite understand. If you back the horse at four dollars and now it's three dollars fifty, why are you aren't allowed to back it at the three dollars fifty? Yep. Or conversely, there's been plenty of times where I make, might have backed the horse at three dollars twenty, and now. Uh, agency A is betting four dollars, even though everyone else is three dollars ninety, and they are obviously keen to lay it. But I'm not allowed to take the four dollars. Like it's it's because the whole thing is so automated, and being run as we discussed before as a as a giant poker machine, that there's just nobody working there who is making the decision. Yes, we'll lay that again. Yep. And I make the point again, if Top Sport, which is a family-owned bookmaking business, will bet you to win 10000 at the $4 and then 10000 at the $3.50, I, it, I just can't quite understand why the other corporates... They make a lot more money. Which make a lot more money. Why they aren't required to bet a reasonable bet. Yep. I think these things would really have a big impact on turnover and one of the problems is that a lot of the taxes that have been brought in in the last 10 years particularly have seen a reduction in turnover because it's not worth it for those corporates. Yeah. Just back on the, the tote rejuvenation, do you think there's a legitimate appetite to rejuvenate tote betting? I think that so much of the focus has been on fixed odds and clearly um, the tab has has doing whatever it can to get people to move into fixed odds. And the way the fixed odds is administered at the moment, it's all in favour of the bookmakers. But I do think that um, so much of uh, the income stream from racing used to come from that paramutual betting. And it's a, a, I know that it's comparing apples and oranges, looking at um, what they do in Hong Kong. But uh, a lot of what they do is all about stimulating turnover there. And I do think that I do think that there should be, if there isn't an appetite for, for regenerating the power mutual, I certainly think that there should be. But it can't be um, rejuvenated under the current circumstance of the seventeen to twenty percent takeout, the rounding down, not betting, not giving dividends in five cent increments. All these things are just uh, so negative to. To the ongoing success of the tab yeah and i think that the other thing that um 
sounds a little bit out of left field, but going forward, we've seen you know the money, all the money that's come from taxing punters going into um, what looks to be higher prize money. But in many, in almost every respect, owning racehorses has never been less affordable for the average person. You know, it's only maybe um, five years ago, I think, that Darren Weir became the first trainer in Australia to um, train the winners of $10 million in prize money. Last year, Chris Waller trained the winners of $40 million in prize money. So a lot of this money has been funneled into the pockets of a, a very few wealthy people. And, and a huge amount of the prize of the money that's been taken from punters has really been put into the pockets of breeders who... By and large, I'm not talking about the small breeders or the hobby breeders, but the big conglomerates like um, Coolmore and Godolphin, et cetera, they really don't return anything to the industry. So uh, I think that getting them to pay their fair share is certainly an important thing. And on the issue of um, racehorse affordability, I can remember in, I think, 1999, I was at the Magic Millions and... Um, Laurie Bricknell and I bought a Marsquet filly that was $40,000 and that was the median price at that sale. And I think a, a year or two ago at um, the Sydney Easter sale, the um, average price for a yearling was $430,000. Well, it's just, it's got completely out of the reach of the average person <laughs> to own a horse either on their own or, or with a friend. So, that is a big issue, and I think it was a, a, a sad thing, really, for racing that Bob Charlie failed in his attempt to uh, get artificial insemination um, legalised here. I think bringing the cost down of owning racehorses is an important thing going forward to keep the industry vibrant. And it'd be a great way to keep grassroots people in, interested in the game as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Just back on the point about, which is I think is an, an important point, which is getting grassroots racing people onto these boards which make decisions. How have we got to the point where we don't have representation on there and how likely is it that someone will put their hand up? Is the problem that nobody from a racing background with a grassroots punting background is nominating for these boards or that it's not getting accepted into the, these type of boards? I think that there's been a concerted push by... Um, people in charge of those boards to get people who don't know anything about racing onto the boards so that they'll be more compliant. Mm, yep. Now, having experience of being on a board might be a great thing, but if you don't have any experience of, uh, with being involved in racing, I'm not sure that you bring any great value to that board going forward. Mm. And, you know, going back when Jack Ingham and Lloyd Williams and people like that were big characters in in racing and on boards I'm, I'm sure racing was much better off having people who really knew about what was going on making the decisions fantastic peter well great to get your thoughts on the game and um to identify a couple of ways we can try and improve the game for everyone so wonderful to, to finish on that point yeah thanks a lot brad at Winning Edge Investments, our team of highly skilled expert analysts and full-time professional punters review the data, crunch the figures, assess the best betting opportunities, and deliver them to your phone via our app and your email inbox in real time so you profit. Go to www.winningedgeinvestments.com, look at our membership options, make your choice, and enter the promo code PODCAST to receive a special 25% discount on your first membership just for listening. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T in capital letters for a 25% ongoing discount on your first membership. Treat your betting like a business and invest intelligently with Winning Edge Investments.